Welcome to this video on virtual work. This is one of several videos in a short course on the analysis of indeterminate structures posted at Tear Yes Toolbox, a website that contains notes, examples, and algorithms for structural analysis. Virtual work plays an important role in modern structural analysis, with many applications. This video addresses the principle of virtual forces, in order to develop a technique that we may refer to as the unit virtual load method. This is a method that allows us to calculate displacements and rotations anywhere in a structure, for any external loading, by placing a unit force at the location where we want the deformation. For that reason, this slide places virtual work in the category of methods for calculating deformations for trusses, beams, and frames. If you have had a look at the videos in the short course on the finite element method, then you will know that the principle of virtual displacements, which is different from the principle of virtual forces employed in this video, appears elsewhere in this map, underpinning the finite element method. The finite element method is a so-called displacement method, which belongs in advanced structural analysis. That method formulates equilibrium equations and the principle of virtual displacements allows us to find the stiffness coefficients that appear in those equations. Conversely, the use of the principle of virtual forces in this video fits nicely together with the flexibility method. That method formulates compatibility equations and the principle of virtual forces allows us to find the flexibility coefficients that appear in those equations. In summary, the principle of virtual displacements is utilized in order to formulate equilibrium equations for displacement methods, such as the finite element method. Conversely, the principle of virtual forces is utilized in order to formulate compatibility equations for the force method that we refer to as the flexibility method. The next slide shows another reason why the unit virtual load method developed in this video might be useful. Structural engineers must often calculate deformations in order to check that so-called serviceability limit states are satisfied. For example, a design code may specify that the maximum deflection of a beam should not exceed 1 300th of its length. The use of virtual work as part of the flexibility method for the analysis of statically indeterminate structures reminds us that the deformation, that is, the stiffness, of statically indeterminate structures influences the distribution of the internal forces, such as bending moments and shear forces. This is why it is possible to strengthen a structure at a particular location, just to later realize that this attracted more bending moment to that region. The next slide does not display virtual work, but rather real work, known from basic physics. The starting point is that work is force times displacement, or moment times rotation. However, in structural analysis the displacements and rotations develop gradually as the load is applied to the structure. If we assume the linear elastic Hooke's law, then the force deformation relationship is linear. This is illustrated on the right-hand side of this slide. This is the reason why the work is one-half times force times displacement. When we integrate the work carried out as the displacement increases, then the total work is the gray shaded triangle shown here. The factor one-half observed here does not appear in virtual work, as explained shortly. But first, the next slide develops more detailed expressions for real internal work. The symbol U is used because that is the common notation for internal strain energy. The first equation addresses axial elongation or shortening of a truss member. The starting point is the volume integral of one half times stress times strain. Next, equilibrium is substituted for the stress and the material law is substituted for the strain, where equilibrium is again substituted for the stress. By carrying out the cross section integral, which yields the area, A, we are left with an integral from 0 to L of 1 half times force times elongation per unit length. Assuming constant axial forces allows us to carry out the integral, leading to the expression, 1 half times force times elongation. This is real internal work. The equation below does the same for beam bending. The starting point is again the volume integral of 1 half times stress times strain. Next. Equilibrium is substituted for the stress and the material law is substituted for the strain, where equilibrium is again substituted for the stress. By carrying out the cross-section integral of z squared, the moment of inertia appears. We are left with an integral from 0 to L of 1 half times moment times rotation per unit length. 
which is called curvature. This is real internal work for beam bending. On the next slide, we start an experiment that is intended to introduce virtual work. For this simply supported beam, assume that a virtual load, denoted by delta F, is applied at the midspan of the beam before the actual real load comes on. The next slide follows the steps of that load application and spells out the external and internal work that is taking place during that process. Notice in the top figure how the external work due to the virtual load is first counted by a gray shaded triangle. The area of that triangle is one half times delta F times the associated displacement, denoted by lowercase delta delta. In the figure below, the internal work is one half times delta M times delta kappa, where kappa is curvature. Next, we observe what happens when the real load, Q, is applied to the structure. Again, a gray shaded triangle shows the real work that emanates from that load, both externally and internally. The triangle means that the factor one half still applies to the calculation of the work. In summary, the two figures identify by shaded areas the virtual work that is carried out when the virtual load is applied, and the real work that is carried out when the real loads are applied. Attention now turns to the green rectangles. These rectangles illustrate the virtual work that is carried out by the virtual force when the real loads are applied. Notice that these green rectangles are virtual force times real deformation. Because of the rectangular shape, this work does not contain the factor one half. The principle of conservation of energy states that the shaded triangles at the top must be equal to the shaded triangles at the bottom when integrated over the volume of the structure. In other words, external work must match the internal work. As a consequence, the green rectangle at the top must equal the green rectangle at the bottom. This leads to the principle of virtual forces, shown in green on the right-hand side. The magic of this formula is that we can apply a virtual force, delta F, anywhere on the structure, and solve for the real displacement, delta, for any kind of loading on the structure. We always let delta F be equal to 1 so that we directly find the displacement, delta, on the left-hand side. Notice that the right-hand side is the integral of virtual moment times real curvature. That is observed directly from the rectangle in the bottom figure. Delta M is the moment diagram for the structure when it is subjected to the unit virtual load, delta F. It is possible to extend this formula to include support settlements, temperature changes, etc. However, let us assume for now that the action that we want to find the deformation for is externally applied loads. In that case, the curvature is M over EI, with M being the bending moment diagram due to the applied loads. The next slide starts the generalization of that formula. At the top, the right-hand side allows for axial deformation and shear deformation, in addition to deformation associated with the bending moment diagram. Notice the pattern in the virtual unit load method. We set the virtual load equal to 1 and place it where we want the displacement, and the right-hand side is simply a matter of summing virtual internal forces times real internal deformations. In the three terms on the right-hand side, the real deformation is elongation, bending, and shear deformation. The equation at the bottom of the slide shows that the technique is applicable also for finding a rotation somewhere in the structure. To accomplish that, we simply apply a unit virtual moment at that location. The next slide explains the analysis procedure by means of a cantilevered beam subjected to uniformly distributed load. Notice in the blue color the bending moment diagram due to the applied load. The red color is used for the unit virtual load on the left-hand side, which is intended to give us the vertical displacement at the tip of the cantilever. Similarly, the unit virtual moment on the right-hand side is intended to give us the rotation at the tip. Instead of carrying out the integral of the virtual work formula with mathematical expressions for the bending moment diagram, we use the quick integration formulas shown on the next slide. These formulas for the integral shown here are included in all textbooks on structural analysis. Relevant to the example on the left-hand side of the previous slide, notice that the integral of a moment diagram that is a parabola like this one, and a triangle, contains the factor 1 over 4. On the next slide, we apply that formula. Instead of carrying out the integral of virtual moment times real curvature mathematically, 
we simply use the formula, which employs the maximum value from the bending moment diagrams shown on the left to find that the displacement at the tip of this cantilever is QL to the power 4 over 8 EI. The next slide does the same for the rotation. Notice from the formula sheet that the integral now contains the factor one third, because we are now integrating the blue parabola with a constant virtual moment diagram, shown in red. The result is that the rotation at the tip of the cantilever is QL cubed over 6 EI. The next slide highlights the utility and correctness of decomposing bending moment diagrams into basic shapes. The exercise on this slide is unnecessary because we already found the displacement at the tip of the cantilever, but notice how the blue parabola can be decomposed into a triangular shape and AQL squared over 8 parabola. The next slide shows the formulas that are now employed when we are combining a triangle, here marked with the red color, with both a triangle and AQL squared over 8 parabola. The next slide shows that we obtain the same result, namely QL to the power 4 over 8 EI. However, Notice how both formulas from the formula sheet on the previous slide appear. An important lesson from this slide is the minus sign applied to the second term. That minus sign says that the virtual work associated with the QL squared over 8 parabola combined with the red rectangle is negative because one is tension at the bottom and the other is tension at the top. These examples included bending deformations only. The next slide asks when axial and shear deformations should be included. For pure truss structures, like the one shown here, axial deformation is the only thing we include, because the members do not have flexural and shear formation. In this case, only the first term in the right-hand side of the virtual work formula at the top of the slide is considered. In contrast, a typical frame, such as the one shown here, will usually have negligible axial and shear deformations. Flexural deformations dominate. For that reason, for typical frame structures, only the middle term in the right-hand side of the virtual work formula is used. For mixed truss frame structures, such as the one shown here, it is harder to give a definitive answer as to whether axial deformations should be included. If the cross-section of the horizontal beam is much larger than the cross-section of the truss member, then it makes sense to include axial deformation in the inclined truss member but not in the horizontal beam member. Shear deformations are rarely included. For shear deformations to matter, the beam would need to be very deep, as shown in this figure. Unless the cross-section height is well more than 10% of the length of the beam, the last term in the virtual work formula can be neglected. That said, if you are interested in shear deformations then have a look at the Timoshenko beam theory document posted at Ter Yes Toolbox. The quantities in the denominator of the shear deformation term is the shear modulus and the so-called shear area of the cross-section. The next slide further extends the principle of virtual forces to include additional effects. This exercise is simply a matter of adding virtual force times real deformation. First, consider the left-hand side. This is where the effect of support settlements is included. The settlement is denoted by delta S. The reaction force at that support, stemming from the unit virtual load applied somewhere else on the structure, is denoted by delta Fs. It is possible to account for several settlements at once, at different supports, which is reflected in these two terms on the left-hand side. Next, we consider axial elongation of members caused by temperature change. Alpha is the coefficient of thermal expansion, delta T is the temperature change, and L is the member length. This means that alpha times delta T times L is the real member elongation, which is exactly what the virtual axial force should multiply with. The inclusion of fabrication error is even simpler, because we simply multiply the virtual force in the member with that change in member length. Next, we look at the flexural effect of temperature change. This happens if the temperature change is different on the two sides of a beam or frame member. The temperature difference is here given in the numerator as delta T top minus delta T bottom. The lower case H in the denominator is the height of the cross section, namely the distance between the two surfaces of the beam that are experiencing temperature change. Alpha is again the coefficient of thermal expansion. Notice that this expresses real curvature due to differential temperature change. The next slide highlights the need to be careful with the signs of the different terms.
We already saw this once in this video, when tension on different sides of a beam led to a minus sign. In general, virtual work due to settlements is negative when the settlement is in the opposite direction of the support reaction force. Similarly, axial deformation terms are negative when the virtual force is tension with real shortening and when the virtual force is compression with real elongation. Flexural virtual work is negative when tension is on different sides for the real and virtual moment diagrams. Virtual work for shear deformation is negative when the real and virtual shear force have different signs within a particular segment of the member. Thanks for watching this video. Please visit Tear Yes Toolbox for more videos and more material relevant for the modern structural engineer. See you soon.